the data advantage still lies with some of these bigger players. But I think that the innovation that these newer startups are bringing on the workflow front is so significant that there's ample room for you know startups to run alongside. Finance teams, they're always struggling, right, with outdated data. We really cannot have a very real-time, accurate view of the financial standing in a business, even for some of the most kind of simple questions, right? Like, what is my ARR? How much cash do I have? Having tools that could surface these insights and also make these updates more automatically, I think that's where we see the market is going. You don't see a ton of explosive starts for companies building the business, but you know, you could see some of the biggest outcomes with some of the strongest business fundamentals when we look at a lot of the metrics. Welcome to Turpentine Finance, a podcast where we talk with top founders and finance leaders about what it takes to architect success. Our guests speak candidly about big business inflections, market curveballs, and how they approach decision making so that you have the tactics and mental models for when the pressure is on. I'm your host, Sasha Orlov founder, CEO, and self-professed finance nerd. You ready? Let's dive in. All right. Hi, everybody. I'm excited for today's episode because Sapphire Ventures published one of the first market maps of CFO software titled Rise of the Next Gen CFO, and it immediately went viral. Why? Because it was one of the first to recognize this inflection point in software for finance teams. And Sapphire Ventures should know a thing or two about finance teams because Sapphire Ventures was founded 20 years ago and has its roots going back to SAP, who pioneered the ERP or Enterprise Resource Planning Software. And today, Sapphire manages over 10 billion assets and is exclusively focused on enterprise software. And they have investments with a couple of small companies you might have heard of, like Monday and Braze and Avid Exchange and Box and DocuSign and LinkedIn and Looker and MuleSoft Square, Auth0, and more. I just sent the largest check to DocuSign today to authorize a higher limit. So good investment there. Anyway, today we're lucky to have the authors of the paper, Jane Lee and Addy Reddy. So welcome to the show, you guys. Thanks for having us, Sasha. Excited to do this. Yep. Looking forward to it. Yeah. Let's dive in. Okay. You authored this piece called The Rise of the Next Gen CFO, which got a lot of attention and I think contributed towards one of the renaissance and investment of Office CFO, which I am obviously excited about. What drove you guys to write this piece? Yeah. You know, when we think about the piece, right, this was published over two years ago now at, at this point. And at the time, you know, a couple of things got us interested I think number one, on the macro front, this was early 2022. So we had just come off of the market correction that happened towards the tail end of 2021. And everybody, you know, was putting their heads together to figure out how to cut costs, reduce burn, you know, preserve your runway and really focus on efficient growth. If we look at the landscape of finance tools at the time, on one hand, we had seen some really successful big businesses getting built in the space, right? Companies like Build.com, Anaplan, you know, Blackline that have gone on to become really large and amazing public companies. But on the other hand, we're also just seeing this explosion of activity around the startup landscape startups, you know, really getting formed to tackle different bits and pieces of the entire finance workflow. So we thought to ourselves, hey, it seems like, you know, CFOs are becoming more strategic. They are taking on a more strategic role with bigger responsibilities and scope. And at the same time, we're seeing this really explosion of activity. Why don't we just go and talk to CFOs and finance leaders in our networks to really understand, you know, what are the key priorities today? Where do the pain points really fall? And where do the opportunities lie for companies building in the space? So we probably, you know, surveyed more than a dozen of CFOs in our networks, talked to probably two to three dozen, you know, customers of some of the most popular tools, both more legacy as well as more next gen and really kind of got a feel for the lay of the land and what's driving a lot of these changes and innovation. And we decided to share a lot of those learnings and insights with folks in this blog post. 
Yeah. And, and, you know, I might add on top of what Jane just mentioned, right? Sort of a personal anecdote that got me interested in, in sort of the category. Previously, before Sapphire, I was actually working in an FPNA role myself and had to do this pretty, pretty insane task every quarter, which was pulling together kind of a thousand row plus spreadsheet reporting on just the top line metrics of the business. And to pull this report together, right? The process was we would go to our BI team, have them run these snowflake queries, send these queries over a CSV file. And then I would just basically do a bunch of formatting over multiple days. You know, this is around the clock work, right? So I'm not, it's sort of a sleepless experience for me. And I'd put together this report and then kind of share that with the senior you know, finance leaders. After doing this process manually for a quarter or two, we started to sort of essentially automate, automate the whole workflow. And so what we did was we had those Snowflake queries push directly into a Power BI instance and kind of populate these dashboards pre-formatted that were very interactive, they were live. And the best part about it was these reports were ready, you know, a day after the, the, the numbers kind of closed for the, for the period. And I just saw how, you know, in the matter of a couple of quarters in automating this process, you know, my life as a financial analyst got so much better, right? Instead of building this report in sort of a painful process, I was uh, up-leveling my work and interpreting the results of the report, right? And, and becoming more of a thought partner to my organization versus just somebody kind of manually building this report. So I really saw firsthand how technology could dramatically kind of improve the finance function. And so I was really just excited to, to kind of see what, what all action was taking place in, in the category. Got it. So it sounds like a mix of personal experience, some success in the market with some big outcomes, sticky products, and a big need. So as you started writing the paper, give us a summary of some of the, the outcomes from the paper. Yeah, I think one of the things that we really wanted to get to the bottom of was why now, right? Why is it now we're seeing this proliferation of activity and innovation in the space? You know, is there something that's fundamentally different about, you know, the industry and the market that's driving the need for new tools and, and whatnot? And I think what we heard over and over is, you know, one, the role of the finance team and of the CFO has definitely evolved over time. You know, I think finance teams and CFOs are no longer just thought of as controllers in a business that oversee the PL. They are asked to become very strategic thought partners to every function inside the business, right? So when we surveyed our CFOs, they told us, hey, like CMOs are coming to us to, you know, look at their funnel conversion data, you know, customer success leaders are coming to us to kind of opine on insights on, you know, churn and upsell and even engineering teams, right? They're coming to us for more visibility around, you know, cloud costs and predictability around that. So I think what you're looking at here is, right, like finance teams are dealing with more people, they're dealing with more data, they're dealing with more systems, and you're dealing with a ton of data fragmentation, right? You're piecing together data from Salesforce, from your HR system, from your data warehouse, and there's really no like single source of truth for you to go to and be like, okay, this is where my error is at today. This is my cash position. And on top of that, you know, people are just doing all of this manually. It's, it's funny, you know, we look at all these tools that have emerged, but you talk to finance teams and the number one tool they use is still Excel. And oftentimes you're just emailing back and forth different versions of the same spreadsheet to different teams inside the org, right? So these finance teams are getting inundated, right, by these new tasks, but the tools that they rely on is still so manual and still so kind of rudimentary. So we felt like there's an opportunity for new tools to come in and better solve for these needs. You know, definitely. And I think some of what Jane mentioned was frankly surprising to us as we did some of this research, right? One of the things she mentioned was that there was really no single source of truth in finance. And I think that's interesting to think about from both the systems and metrics perspective. Uh, from a system standpoint, right, you have the ERP, which has the general ledger and sort of houses all your accounting data. You have your CRM and billing tools that typically have more operational kind of top line metrics like bookings or ARR. You may have kind of a cloud data warehouse like a Snowflake that has aggregated some of that information, but it doesn't look at expense data, which lives in your ERP. So you kind of quickly see how there's no one single place to go and get the full picture of, of sort of how your business is doing. And then from a metrics perspective, right, it's so interesting. 
ARR seems like such a simple you know, thing to calculate, but depending on what system you pull the data from, depending on who's doing that calculation in the organization, that number can be different. And so that can kind of create a lot of challenges when it comes to thinking about you know, building reports, running an analytics and making decisions in the organization. And, and so really feel like that's a huge gap kind of in, in, in kind of the finance function today. And then as Dave mentioned, right, I mean, the amount of workflows that are still occurring in Excel are just remarkable. You have large, large organizations at scale, public companies even, that are that are using Excel to run kind of regular reporting. And that's, you know, incredibly error prone. The governance is very poor there. So it really feels like there's a ton of opportunity to kind of improve that. One of the things we like to talk about at, at Sapphire when it comes to kind of office, this office of the CFO tooling is you have a lot of databases in this space, but you don't have a lot of workflow tools. And, and we kind of refer to it as you don't have a lot of tools that kind of enable the ING in finance, right? The planning, the budgeting, the reconciling. And so I think Jane and I, you know, and our team got very excited about, hey, like as, as SaaS investors, right? We've seen this happen in sales, seen this happen in marketing, other teams, like it's time for finance to kind of benefit from some of that innovation as well. And I think that will probably tee up a fun conversation about AI and what you guys think about from an investing principle later. But to close out this sort of set of thoughts, so you have these findings in the paper, this sort of transition of a role from kind of controller reporting to a strategic thought partner and these other additional needs in that role where finance sort of needs this view of, of the company. And some of the surprises that you sort of pulled out, there's no single source of truth. A lot of stuff still happening in Excel, lots of different databases, the need for some engineering support. Um, what do you think was the, the reason why this exists? And, and what was the call for more tools? What were you hoping to accomplish with it? Why do we think Excel has been sort of the de facto solution in this space? And there hasn't been a lot of tooling before. I think a couple, a couple of thoughts there, right? First of all, Excel, as many would argue, is probably one of the greatest pieces of enterprise software ever created, right? It's got maybe over a billion users today. It's taught in schools across the world. If you want to be a business analyst, like that's the tool that you, you learn how to use. And I would say as a result, you know, finance for decades has just gotten by using Excel, right? It's very painful. You have to kind of build and rebuild model logic. It's error prone, all the things I kind of mentioned earlier. Uh, but we've just made it work, right? And I think as the requirements of finance have changed and become more complex, it's not only that that's a painful experience, it actually just doesn't work. It starts to break. And I think that's where we feel like we were a couple of years ago even and sort of saw this explosion in tooling. I think secondly, from sort of the perspective of the software builder, right, the entrepreneur, when you were starting out building enterprise software and, you know, no, no company in the world had gone through kind of the quote unquote digital transformation, you know, there was a lot of green space. And so what do you do? You build for the most lucrative um, teams that you possibly can, where you can deliver the greatest customer value and sort of ROI and impact. So you look for revenue generating teams, you look for large cost centers, you look for teams with scaled headcount so you can sell, you know, a lot of seats so on and so forth. And so as a result, we think finance has sort of frankly been treated as a second class citizen uh, for many years. But that's again changing now as the roles become you know, a lot more com uh, complex and the needs have evolved. But also more import importantly, the view of finance internally is, is as you mentioned, Sasha, um, you know, a strategic thought partner and mission critical to the kind of success of the business. And so as a result now, there's budget and there's appetite to kind of go and equip and enable and sort of supercharge this team. So that's why we think sort of the category is, is quite exciting going forward. Yeah, Excel is a, a, a hard piece of software to compete with because it is the ultimate definition of flexibility and it is about as cheap as they come. As long as you give up one blue bottle of coffee every, every month, you can basically afford Excel. All right, so there is this like now awareness that, there is an opportunity here, as you pointed out, there's been successes in the market, a lot in the enterprise space. We're talking about Anaplan or, or Blackline or things like that. There is this incredibly formidable competitor called Excel that is very cheap, very widely distributed and incredibly flexible. But as teams grow, the role of the CFO is changing and they need to be this real-time thought partner. And that becomes a bit of a challenge. And so with that, hopefully becomes opportunities for many of us, including myself, building in the space. Um, but in this paper that you published, you, you published six predictions. Since it was also written two years ago, I'd love for you to go through each of these and then tell me which is your favorite and which one becomes maybe less relevant now. 
Yeah. Well, I think one of the overarching themes we continue to see kind of in finance is uh, just the convergence with data science, right? Like, like I mentioned, finance teams are dealing with more data, data coming from different systems. But I think, you know, to the point of Excel, you know, the limitations of that is just a lack of real-time data that you deal with. I think finance teams, they're always struggling, right, with outdated data. They have to piece together data from these different systems. A lot of times, right, that lags by 30, 90 days. You really cannot have a very real-time, accurate view of the financial standing in a business, even for some of the most kind of simple questions, right? Like, what is my ARR? How much cash do I have? So I think having tools that could better plug into these underlying systems to pull up this data in a more real-time fashion, surface these insights, and also make these updates more automatically, I think that's where we see the market is going and where we see a lot of the pain points kind of from finance teams stem from. And and I would definitely add, right, I think the key challenge there is if you don't have a real-time view, you can't actually make decisions with the data. You're just reporting on stuff that's happened, you know, in the last month, in the last 90 days. But I think the importance of real-time data is, hey, can I see where the business is today so I can make a decision tomorrow to improve the outcome of the fiscal period that I'm that I'm in. And I think that's where that, that gets very powerful. And then to kind of Jane's point about the convergence of finance and data science, it goes back to my, I think my experience in FBA, which is you can really, really up level the role of the financial analyst. And I think that's just very exciting, right? You just do higher order work. You're thinking critically and interpreting the data, not building the reports underneath to the very sort of low value add type tasks that we think AI can automate and data science teams, frankly, can, can automate as well. So, you know, I think those are some of the predictions that we made a couple of years ago, frankly, you know, seeing a lot of that play out today, which has been pretty exciting for, for Jane and myself. All right. So if we if we summarize them and then you guys have to pick which one's your favorite and then which one you think is the the least relevant now, or I guess you can pass as well. Okay. One, the next gen of finance is being driven by the convergence of data science. Two, explosion of cloud utilization is driving the need for programmatic monitoring and optimization of cloud costs. Three, growing demand for SaaS platforms is driving the need for intelligent and automated billing and RevRec tools to manage contracts from a vendor perspective. Four, accounting close remains a frustratingly manual process, creating the need for automation financial close solutions to reduce time and errors and streamline reporting. Five, the rise of tokenized economy has created widespread confusion with regards to tax and accounting implications, resulting in the need for third-party software to simplify taxes such as cryptocurrency and businesses to remain compliant. And number six, the growing demand for real-time financial data. All right, Jane, over to you. Which one is your favorite? I also have to say the real time need for data and for that to flow through everything else. All right, Adi. I would say, and I'm biased here since I was a financial analyst before, but certainly the convergence of finance and data science improving the lives of the analyst. Hey, we'll get back to the conversation in a moment after a word from our sponsors. Hey, finance leaders, do you remember when Amazon didn't have to charge sales tax on every online purchase? Well, 10 years later, we see sales tax on e-commerce everywhere. That wave is now hitting SaaS and the digital economy, and Anrock is here to help you navigate this new tax compliance journey. As your software business grows, so does your global tax liability. But keeping up with ever-changing regulations across multiple jurisdictions can be overwhelming. That's where Anrock comes in. Anrock is the enterprise-grade solution that automates sales tax compliance worldwide. Anrock tracks your exposure, calculates tax, and handles filings all in one platform. As a Turpentine Finance listener, you can get a free Nexus study from Anrock today. See your economic and physical Nexus in real time by connecting your billing and HRIS tools. You'll get a clear view of your exact exposure in any jurisdiction, plus a live review with a SaaS tax expert. Don't let tax compliance slow down your growth. Visit anrock.com forward slash turpentine to claim your free Nexus study and take control of your SaaS tax strategy. Anrock, empowering software businesses to grow across the globe. What does the future hold for business? Ask nine experts and you'll get 10 answers. It's a bull market. It's a bear market. Rates will rise or fall. Can someone invent a crystal ball? Until then... 
Over 40,000 businesses have future-proofed their business with NetSuite by Oracle, the number one cloud ERP, bringing accounting, financial management, inventory, and HR into one fluid platform. With one unified business management suite, there's one source of truth, giving you the visibility and control you need to make quick decisions. With real-time insights and forecasting, you're peering into the future with actionable data. When you're closing the books in days, not weeks, you're spending less time looking backwards and more time on what's next. If I had needed this product, it's what I'd use. Whether your company is earning millions or even hundreds of millions, NetSuite helps you respond to your immediate challenges and seize your biggest opportunities. Speaking of opportunity, download the CFO's guide to AI and machine learning at netsuite.com slash 102. The guide is free to you at netsuite.com slash 102. That's netsuite.com slash 102. Cool. And any of these you think over the course of time became less relevant today than it was when you were originally doing research or predictions? I would say maybe some of the trends and, and market booms and busts we've seen with crypto. I think at the time, you know, there was a lot of kind of need given the complexity with dealing with crypto assets. How do you do bookkeeping with them, tax implications? These days, I think, you know, we've gotten over that initial hump and that's kind of played its course. And now we're on to a lot of other exciting developments in the space. Definitely. And then, I mean, I would say, honestly, looking at some of the other uh, predictions we had, it feels like they were very groundbreaking when we made them and now they don't seem as groundbreaking. But I think that's actually for a good reason, because now it's a lot more commonplace to be kind of investing in these areas, right? But whether it's kind of cloud cost optimization or, or billing or, or whatnot. So frankly, just excited to see a lot of these predictions kind of, you know, coming true and, and playing out. Got it. Maybe give me time for an updated version in the world of Gen AI. Speaking of that, back to your back to your other point. How do you think sort of the popularity of how easy it is to commercialize and embed AI into tools now? How do, does this change any of the findings? And how do you think it changes? Yeah, I mean, I think when we wrote the piece, I guess it was sort of in some ways pre kind of the big AI uh, boom and. At that time, I think uh, a lot of software tooling was focused on enabling a human to kind of do their job. And I think today we're switching the paradigm and I think we're still in this transition, but thinking more about how do we actually get work done? How do we uh, sort of tackle the labor budget or the labor opportunity and, you know, fully or partially automate entire uh, job functions so we can up-level the folks that, that are kind of there working alongside AI. So I think in that way, we see a lot of these workflows and tools, maybe thinking about how to, to go after the entire work and the entire workflow versus just an element of the task. Jane, any, any thoughts or predictions on the importance of AI in this space, in the sector? Yeah, when I think about, you know, the core responsibilities of finance teams, whether it's bookkeeping, you know, accounting, taxes, it's a lot of these very manual and repetitive workflows that follow a kind of a standard workflow and way of doing things. And I think that creates kind of the perfect opportunity, right, for AI to come in and learn that and be able to do that on its own. And this is like, not news to finance tools. I mean, we've had OCR technology that was advertised as, you know, ML, AI for some time now. And, but I think like when we look at kind of the the next phase of what, what could be become of these tools is kind of the auto completion, right? Of tasks versus giving you the tool and the software itself to carry and do these tasks alone. Uh, but I will say, you know, when it comes to selling into finance teams, right? Like dealing with data, very kind of mission critical data, the bar for, and the room for error is zero, right? So if you're building a tool selling into finance teams, this needs to be highly accurate. It needs to take into, you know, security, data sharing, safety concerns into consideration. So I would say in terms of kind of enterprise adoption we're seeing, for these tools, it's still early days, but that's not to say kind of the the overall long-term impact, right, this set of technology could have on this user group, on this landscape. As you think about this, it's an unprompted question. As, as you start to think about this, there are some industries in which AI is improving the incumbency. So if we think about like Facebook ads, for example, like their use of AI has pretty much dominated and improve their business model to a, a massive extent. 
whereas AI seems to be threatening Google's search business model, a big incumbent business model. Do you think, if we think five, 10 years from now, are the same giants going to be bigger? Or do we think there's going to be a next wave of incumbents that are going to take meaningful market share from some of the, the big legacy incumbent giants in the space of fights? I think, you know, one of the broader themes we've seen around finance is kind of this idea of unbundling, right? Kind of the first gen was all of these ERPs, right? These core systems of records that had all of this functionality built in around it. So they could do everything from the general ledger to your billing system, your AP system, to everything else. But then slowly over time, what we've seen is, you know, these point solutions have come up, right? And they've become really large, successful businesses just specifically targeting one piece of that workflow. So you have like Bill.com doing accounts payables automation. You have Anaplan just doing the financial planning piece, et cetera. So I think because of the surface area is so large and I would say finance is probably one of the most horizontal markets out there. You know, every business doesn't matter if you're big, small, in whatever industry vertical, you're going to need to build your customers. You're going to need to close your books. You're going to need to make these financial statements. The surface area is just massive. And you could build these very successful businesses just targeting very specific pain points, right? So I will say like, while we've seen this kind of unbundling, we're also seeing a little bit of rebundling again, right? Like with these companies that have had their initial wedge, maybe targeting one piece of the workflow, for example, spend management. And now we're seeing the convergence again with the more upstream workflow, right? Around procurement. And we're seeing this all in one platform that's doing procurement all the way to spend management, to accounts payables and everything. So it's a good question. I mean, I think depending on the macro environment, depending on the priorities, right, these buyers are facing, CFOs are not the easiest buyers to sell into. I think you need to really understand what it is that their pain point is at that moment in time and be able to demonstrate an ROI and kind of value around that. Yeah. And I'd say, you know, certainly an interesting question. I mean, when we think about, you know, incumbents versus, you know, startups in other, in other kind of AI markets, we always go back to who has the data advantage, right? And if you have the data advantage, you have the access to that data, you can build the best, you know, and most accurate AI. And I, I think that, you know, at a high level holds true, the ERPs and kind of the legacy incumbents have all the data. But I think there is one thing, uh, sort of one step that's missing between owning the data and then fully automating with AI, which is kind of to a point we were making earlier, they were never the workflow tools in the middle. And so today you have these startups coming up who are just offering like a night and day kind of different experience, just a fundamentally different way to think about running your finance kind of workflows. And so I think it would be, you know, quite difficult, frankly, for some of the incumbents to sort of orient them, reorient themselves around that new paradigm of, of finance software. So look, I mean, what happens, we don't know that the, the data advantage still lies with some of these bigger players, but I think that the innovation that these newer startups are bringing on the workflow front is so significant that there's ample room for, you know, kind of startups to run alongside them. I love it. I love it. Let's transition a bit of the conversation over from sort of your market map and the landscape to how you guys think about and evaluate investments in this space, because I think it's it's really insightful and helpful. So if we kind of go through what are the things you like about investments in this space, what makes it a good category for investment, where are some of the themes that you think it's going, and how do you think about an investment and balancing some of these complications when, when you're thinking about investment. Let's start with the first part. What do you think makes this category a good category for venture investment? Yeah, I think, you know, as enterprise software investors, we spend a lot of time in broader horizontal application SaaS. And I think one of the characteristics about CFO tooling that's really stood out to me is just around a lot of the complexity, right, you have to deal with when you're building in the space, whether that's wrangling data, right, aggregating data, normalizing that data to, you know, it's not an easy tool to implement a lot of times. You need to integrate with a lot of different systems. So a lot of times what we see is it takes actually quite a bit of upfront investments and time to get 
a really good product going. But once you kind of could get over that initial hump, you see some of the most enduring businesses getting built in the space that just compound over time. And these are highly sticky solutions that are really mission critical to these businesses, right? So I think, you know, maybe you don't see a ton of like explosive starts for companies building the business, but, you know, you could see some of the biggest outcomes with some of the strongest business fundamentals when we look at a lot of the metrics in these businesses. And, you know, even just like talk about NetSuite, right? They were founded in the late 1990s and they raised, I don't know, like $150 million to get the first product out that took so many years. And fast forward, you know, it is the industry standard these days for your GL uh, and it continues to grow and compound over time 30, 40 years later. So that's one example. And even more recently, you know, the OneStream IPO, that has just filed. I mean, if you look at their financials, it's a 500 million AR business growing 30%. I mean, just as compounded over time, has rolled out different products. I mean, also has some of the strongest metrics that we've seen in the space. So those are just some of the things that we really come to appreciate about the space. And actually during the market downturn, right? A couple of years back, we actually saw a lot of our CFO tools companies demonstrate a lot of resiliency because people still need to close their books. They still need to like, you know, do all these things to build their customers and whatnot. Yeah. I think I saw uh, Oracle doesn't report on internal numbers for NetSuite, but I think about two or three years ago in one of the earnings reports, they said it was one of the fastest growing divisions and pieces of software inside of their system, contributing towards a larger percent of their enterprise value 25 years later, which is just insane. All right. So you talked about sort of some of the themes. We broke this down into a couple of themes. It's it's kind of required software. So more resilient in sort of terms of, of, of the economy, huge technical barrier, but highly sticky. And once built sort of can continue to compound, you know, up to 25, 30 years later, but some real challenges as well, sort of incumbent moats, Lots of data integrations that create these sort of network effects within the category and super sticky. So if we then think about, you know, what are the themes that get you excited? Where do you see the biggest attack vectors being? How do you answer that question? In terms of some of the themes that we've we've been seeing, I think one is kind of, you know, given that it is such a big horizontal market, right? We've started to actually see a lot of verticalized solution tackling different industries and verticals and building workflows and integration points that are specific to that industry, right? Whether that's healthcare, real estate, professional services. And I think there is an opportunity and pretty sizable opportunity for these verticalized solutions to become big outcomes as well. Definitely. And then I think back to our earlier discussion with AI, I think going in and messaging and trying to attack specific workflows for finance and pitching real hard ROI, right? I'll go back to kind of personal experience again, a very common task that some that a financial analyst sort of completes is kind of a periodic BVA or budget versus actual kind of variance analysis, right? And that again is a manual process, takes many hours per month, very error prone if you do it manually. And it involves a lot of data that lives in systems. So it's actually a very good candidate for AI. And so you have startups right now, sort of in the FP&A and kind of planning space that are coming out and saying, hey, like we have access to all these data. To your point, Sasha, we've built these integrations already with these different systems so we can access that information. Um, let us look through and actually pull these reports together. Let us dig into the general ledger level detail and, and tell you why the numbers are, are not kind of on plan and then help you again, up level your conversation with your budget partners or with your leaders instead of being bogged down with reporting. So I think that value proposition, because that's a workflow that happens so regularly, takes so much time, is error prone, is so critical to running the business. I think coming to the market with that sort of a messaging approach is, is pretty effective. And then, you know, in the world of finance, you have kind of in-house corporate finance and accounting teams. You also have service providers that work with these finance teams like accounting firms. And so can you go in and, and sell to them, right? And kind of effectively get indirect distribution to all these companies that work with these accounting firms by automating that accounting workflow, which again is a very data rich, repetitive task that has sort of a guidebook, right? The gap standards that tells you what's right and what is wrong. And so again, it's sort of a great candidate for AI to kind of go solve. So I think 
again, attacking the market from some of these different angles in terms of how you message your value proposition and focusing on kind of clear, hard ROI, which hasn't necessarily been the emphasis for, for finance tooling before. It could be quite a compelling way. And we've seen some startups sort of take that, you know, that approach as well. Hey, we'll get back to the conversation in a moment after a word from our sponsors. Real talk. Most talent leaders haven't yet cracked how to leverage AI for meaningful impact on their hiring processes and business goals. But the leaders who are effectively using AI to transform their recruiting team's efficiency and quality use MetaView. MetaView is the AI assistant for the interview process. Their AI records and transcribes hiring conversations, like intakes, interviews, and debriefs, then provides perfectly summarized notes of everything that was discussed. That means your people can focus on creating a human connection with candidates during calls and save time on the busy work of cleaning up notes after every interview. But it's so much more than just a time saver because perfect notes means perfect data. For every candidate and every pipeline, hiring teams can make confident, informed decisions and talent leaders can finally take control of the interview process. Join forward-thinking talent leaders at high-performing organizations like Brex, HelloFresh, and Quora and check out MetaView. Head over to metaview.ai slash heretics to talk to one of MetaView's product experts or get started for free. You'll be up, running, and AI-enabled in minutes. Omnikey uses generative AI to enable you to launch hundreds of thousands of ad iterations that actually work, customized across all platforms with a click of a button. I believe in Omnikey so much that I invested in it, and I recommend you use it too. Use Cogrev to get a 10% discount. What's your view on building on top of existing platforms versus rebuilding a core? So we talked a little bit about sort of the incumbency of, say, QuickBooks or NetSuite or tools like Excel or fp a tools like Anaplan, right? Excel theoretically is an all to everything type of value prop. It also has comes with that flexibility, comes at the expense of some functionality or building on top of a solution puts you at risk. Like you talked about bill.com did have a great outcome. And that was the solution for bills for QuickBooks for a very long time until it wasn't and QuickBooks decided. So how do you guys think about platform risk versus wedge versus kind of, you know, rebuilding from the core? I think it depends on, you know, your entry point, right, to the stack. And I know, you know, when we think about, and actually like kind of this next giant ERP category has been quite active and we kind of are seeing a lot of different approaches from people tackling this core system of record problem. Anyone from, you know, you know, puzzle like you guys trying to build it from the ground up and really re-architecting the way that the ERP should run, how you auto-generate reports and pull in real-time data and reconciliations to folks, you know, maybe who are tackling the higher end of the market where you have an existing ERP. But when you look at a lot of the limitations, right, of an ERP or an FP&A tool that historically have acted as a database and where they've really fallen short is more on the front end, the configurability and the usability piece. So I think to be a large and scalable and powerful platform, you need to be able to tackle both the front end and the back end. Front end being, uh, you know, a platform that's highly usable for folks, right? Because finance, like we talked about, involves kind of stakeholders from every part of the organization and everybody has to chime in, right, in the planning process or whatever it might be. So having some sort of front end that's easy enough for everybody else to use, you don't need special coding language to tweak anything going on in the model. I think that's really important. But then also on the back end, right, is about having this really powerful engine that could support, you know, these different dimensions and different volumes of data, right, as the company scales. Yeah, and I think actually Jane's last one is very interesting because in finance software, so Jane and I kind of spend a lot of our time in, in B2B SaaS application software. And, you know, the question always comes up like, hey, what's the moat? What's the moat, right, between, between two software app companies? And usually you, you don't typically point to a technical moat. It's, it's usually not a technical barrier to kind of replicate what's been built. And so I think if you do take that 
you know, more difficult path and, and longer path of building that, you know, core backend, as Jane mentioned, you actually do benefit uniquely in, in an app software category from a technical moat and sort of barrier to entry. And so that kind of gives you a long runway with your, with your business. But I think, you know, kind of going back to the, the, the core question here, like, in my opinion, going forward, I, I do think we will see more interoperability than less. The extent of that, you know, I don't know, but I do think like ultimately, you know, for finance applications to work and even for their backends, you know, systems of record to succeed, they need to talk to each other and they need to kind of enable each other to be successful. You sort of see this happen with kind of the CRM Salesforce and kind of Salesforce app ecosystem dynamic as well. But, you know, I think we'll see that more and more with, with kind of the core ERPs. But, you know, obviously companies like Puzzle that are taking kind of a modern approach to this are, are going to be much, much better positioned to kind of enable that, that next generation of, you know, of, of finance tooling. You said it, not me, but I, I do. I do agree. I think there are a lot of really exciting opportunities and there's no probably right answer because this industry has been somewhat neglected and underfunded for quite a long time compared to go-to-market software or marketing software. Some of the other sort of more directly tied to revenue and people fighting for software where I think finance teams share like want to be thrifty and want to keep operating costs down lower. That sometimes comes at the expense of these big macro changes like AI and the shifting needs of their, their companies. Let's Transition now to a little bit more about Sapphire Ventures. Tell us a little bit more about Sapphire, what gets you guys excited. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, our bread and butter is we focus on enterprise software investing. So we invest everything from the infrastructure layer all the way up to the application layer. And really our mantra is to partner with exceptional teams building what we call companies of consequence. So to us, that means enduring companies that can become category leaders. And I think I love kind of the emphasis on enduring companies and the implications for also building an office of the CFO, as we've seen with a lot of kind of the big su successes that we've seen in this category. And, you know, and I think our goal to our companies is to be long-term partners, right? Not just from a capital provider standpoint, but also being your thought partners, and, you know, help leverage kind of the enterprise network that we have, the, you know, the kind of expertise we have on the go-to-market excellence side of things to be there along every step of your growth journey. I think you, you guys spun out of like the OG of enterprise software along the way. I know it, it's been a while since the, the founding of SAP. Are there still themes of SAP throughout the office or your, your council or, or the strategy? You know, we became independent over a decade ago now at this point. So as a firm, we are completely financial returns driven. But that said, I think given given those roots, that's really kind of dictated our focus on all things enterprise software. And we do also have, you know, a lot of learnings and insights, right, from having such uh, strong connections to you know, SAP and other players in the SAP ecosystem. So I would say, you know, that remains kind of the core of what we do. And we continue to be excited for all the developments going on in, in this area. Us too. How can people who are interested get a hold of you? You know, feel free to shoot us a note over email. We'll maybe leave that in the show notes. And yeah, if you're building in this space or just want to chat about it, we're more than happy to, to geek out on it anytime. Sapphireventures.com, I'm assuming. That's right. Cool. Well, we look forward to seeing the next piece and the splash it makes on the industry. Thank you guys both so much for agreeing to come on and sharing some of your insights. We'll link to the article in the show notes, to your content information in the show notes, and obviously Sapphire Ventures website in the show notes. Thank you, guys. Awesome. Had so much fun, Sasha. Thanks. Thanks for tuning in to Turpentine Finance. Share it with your executive team, direct reports, friends, and family. And if you want to support the show, the best ways are to leave a review wherever you're listening and subscribe. Turpentine Finance is part of Turpentine, the podcast network behind Moment of Zen, Turpentine VC, Age of Miracles, and more. Shows for experts, by experts in tech.